Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Colin Howells here once again welcoming you to Colin's Corner where we are going to be looking at the next study in the book of Revelation. I've entitled it Practicing the Presence of God based on chapter 22, the first five verses and also verses 8 and 9. So I'll switch over to the slides and we'll begin the study together. The title comes from an unusual source. It's the English title of a series of meditations written by a French Carmelite friar who was born in 1605 and who was known as Brother Lawrence when he became a monk. His thoughts and maxims were assembled under this title as the book expressed the author's increasing awareness of the presence of God. The title is appropriate for this study because verse 4 of this last chapter of Revelation speaks of God's servants serving him and we are told that they will see his face. This statement is a total reversal of what God had told Moses back in the book of Exodus. You cannot see my face, for no one may see it and live. And yet in Genesis chapter 32, we also read, Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So we've got some apparent contradictions. We find the same type of contradiction in the New Testament, where on the one hand we read, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be glory for ever and ever. And yet we also read, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The solution to these apparent inconsistencies lies in the fact that the verb to see is used in different ways. If we look at these texts, we can see the changes. There are two ways in which God's people can see him, and two where it is impossible. We can't see God with our physical eyes for the simple reason that he is spirit. Neither can we, as sinners, contemplate him directly because of his greatness and the brightness of his glory. We need someone as a go-between in order for us to approach him. But when we use the verb to see in the sense of finally understanding, comprehending, discerning something of the wonder and beauty of God, having been previously blind to it, suddenly we say, ah, I see. We can see him face to face through the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John could therefore write that he had seen his glory, his dwelling among us, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And yet that same apostle went on to write, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who himself is God, as is in the closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. So having briefly covered that question, a second one comes to mind. What does he look like? Throughout the book of Revelation, John has constantly avoided describing God. He's concentrated on what surrounds him, and what he appears to be like. If you question a conservative evangelical 
you will probably obtain one answer concerning what God is like. If you put the same question to a liberal, a Catholic or a Muslim, that will produce a radically different answer. And Caucasians tend to see God and consider him as being white, whereas Africans or Hispanics image him as being black. My wife discovered this when teaching a Sunday school class uh, in, in uh, Belgium, children originally from Africa, and they were drawing black figures of, in biblical stories. The eminent psychologist Dr. Kurt Gray, director of the Deepest Beliefs Laboratory at the University of North Carolina, undertook a study which revealed that people tend to believe in a God that looks like them. Now this is disturbing because it shows that many people no longer believe that we were created in God's image, but that he was created in ours. Now we must never forget that God is spirit, that the second person of the Trinity became human in the person of the Lord Jesus. He certainly had a face, and I'm certain that he never looked like any of the Hollywood portrayals, or even like us. Having said all that, let's consider the fact that in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be able to gaze upon God forever and ever. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that implies, but I'm sure that seeing the face of God means far more than actually looking at a portrait. Having said that, seeing God's face is just one of the blessings of being in the new heaven and the new earth, as we shall see. In our passage, John sees this. An angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the street of the city. Once again, John's source for this river, flowing from the throne of God, comes from the image portrayed for us in Ezekiel chapter 47, where a river flows beneath the threshold of the temple. However, here there's a major difference. In Revelation, the river can't flow from the temple, because there is no temple in the New Jerusalem. We saw that back in chapter 21. So here, the temple is replaced by the throne of God and of the Lamb. But we need to go back even further to the book of Genesis, where we read that there was a river watering the garden that flowed from Eden. Eden. The new heaven and new earth take us back to God's original creation before Adam sinned and God subjected it, together with all creation, to the curse. I suggest that these verses give us a glimpse of what God's ultimate purpose in history was, and that if Genesis 3 tells us the story of paradise lost, Revelation 22 tells us of paradise regained. Philip Moore, in his brief commentary on Revelation, points out that all great cities have great rivers. Nineveh, Babylon, Rome, Paris, London, New York, all are built on important rivers. But Jerusalem doesn't have a river. It depended on an outside spring, and it was vulnerable until King Hezekiah built an aqueduct, which is still there today, a secure tunnel to bring water from Gihon, the spring, into the city. This lack of water from within the city didn't stop the prophets referring to the water of life flowing from the Lord's house. Joel prophesied it before the exile, Ezekiel during the exile, 
and Zechariah after it. Now Moore suggests that this lack of physical water led the sons of Korah to understand that the Lord had chosen Jerusalem deliberately in order to express a spiritual truth. The fact that Jerusalem's river was none other than God himself. And so they were able to declare there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. Many years later, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus himself declared, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Now, some people have objected that no Old Testament scripture actually mentions those words, unless Jesus was referring to the words of Korah in Psalm 46, which Ezekiel went on to echo in chapter 47. What is clear is that based on Revelation 21, God's children will be able to drink freely of the water of life. Here, in chapter 22, that spring has become a river as epitomized by that which flowed in Eden, that which Ezekiel saw in his vision. And to object, as some do, that the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned in the context of this river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, is to miss the point, because it is the Spirit himself who is the living water cleansing, refreshing, empowering. When Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well in Sychar, he told her that the water that he would give her would become a well of water welling up to eternal life. And later, as I already said, on that last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, he declared, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. We move to the river banks. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healings of the nations. So verse 2 pursues the theme of the river running through the middle of the city, bordered on either side by the tree of life, bearing fruit continually, and whose leaves bring healing to the nations. And this image again has a double source. We find the first reference to the tree of life in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 and 3 verse 22, telling us that had Adam eaten from it, he would have lived forever. In Ezekiel, we have the picture of healing water flowing from the temple, forming a river along whose banks are trees that bring forth new fruit each month, and whose leaves are for healing, fruit trees of all kinds. So in both Old and New Testament, water is frequently associated with the salvation of God, the life imparting and cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now the commentator Mounts asks the question, why would healing be required in the eternal city? Here we find an evocative language of the most potent kind. In the restored Eden, all has been reversed. Eating of one tree brought the curse, eating of this tree eternal life. The healing leaves indicate the complete absence of physical and spiritual want. The life to come will be a life of abundance and perfection. As we've just seen, the most obvious parallel is found in the opening chapters of Genesis, as well as the passage in Ezekiel 47. As has often been the case in Revelation, to interpret this 
literally is totally out of keeping with the rest of the book. When John saw the vision of the new heaven and new earth described in the previous chapter, he wrote that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What we are experiencing, what we are witnessing here, is the new Genesis, where there is no longer any curse. And in addition to this, if the city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine, then the monthly yielding of fruit, which would logically be based on solar days and lunar months, must also be figurative. I suggest, therefore, that Sam Storms is correct in assuming and affirming that the healing leaves indicate a complete absence of any physical or spiritual want. Dennis Johnson, in his book The Triumph of the Lamb, writes this, The imagery of abundant fruit and medicinal leaves should be understood as symbolic of the far-reaching effects of the death of Christ in the redeemed community, the Holy City. So powerful is the salvation of God that the effects of sin are completely overcome. The eternal life God gives to the redeemed community will be perpetually available, will sustain and will cure every former sin. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God cursed the serpent to crawl on its belly, Eve to suffer pain in childbirth, Adam to endure painful toil in providing for his family. And he and Eve were both banished from the garden, flaming cherubim blocking the way to the tree of life. Here in verse 3, the curse is removed. Nothing now stands between us and the enjoyment of this true life in God's presence forever. And the tense of the verb shifts from present to future, showing that John describes what he expects to take place in the New Jerusalem in the future. And so what Adam set in motion by his disobedience is now overcome and replaced by the blessing that Christ, the second Adam, has set in place by his obedience. Anything and everything that was subjected to the curse, material creation, humanity, relationships, everything will be eliminated in the new earth. So if Genesis 3 describes what happened when mankind sinned and creation was cursed, the last two chapters of scripture show us the life as God intended it to be and that he will him eventually and ultimately make it to be free from every last vestige of sin. In the second part of verse 3, John underlines the presence of the throne and of the Lamb in the city. And he adds, his servants will serve him. The verb he uses, latrio, means to serve in common day usage. But in the New Testament, Paul uses it for the worship offered to God. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. You find that in Philippians chapter 3 in the New King James Version, which is the rendering preferred here by many of the translations. It's hard for us to envisage service as something pleasurable because when we work, we work in an age of painful toil, of tiring and frustrating labour. 
how much has been done to eliminate this in the Western world. There are many millions of humans across the world who work in atrocious conditions. Part of the curse that God inflicted upon the earth was to ensure that the earth never provides us with ultimate fulfillment. Many people think of work and service as a painful necessity. But when we get to heaven, it will no longer be toilsome labour, a duty where we struggle and strain. Quite the opposite is true. Our service will be a high calling indeed. God created Adam to serve him, to be vice-regent, ruling over his creation, administrating his sanctuary by guarding and by keeping. God called Israel to be his servant, again, guarding and keeping his heritage or his inheritance. And within Israel, he called the Levites to be his servants, again, guarding and keeping. There is no higher honour in the Old Testament than to be called to be the servant of the Lord. And God even called upon his own son to become a servant. In the servant songs of Isaiah, notably chapter 42, we read this, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, he will bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light to the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And Jesus applied this passage to himself when he challenged the Pharisees because he'd healed a man with a deformed hand on the Sabbath day. This servant of God was also the Son of God par excellence. It shouldn't therefore come as a surprise to read in chapter 21 verse 7, those who are victorious will inherit all of this and I will be their God and they will be my children. There's no contradiction between us serving God and seeing his face because it is to his faithful servants that he unveils his radiance. For the first time verse 3 also makes mention of the inhabitants of the city. Until now John has only mentioned pilgrimages undertaken by the nations and the kings of the earth. That is back in chapter 21. And yet, as we saw in our last study, the city is now called the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And if we look down to verses 8 and 9, we see how important it is to wor worship and to serve God and only Him. When John fell down before the angel who was showing him these things, he was immediately reprimanded and told to worship God alone. That's something that we need to remember as we serve and worship God today. Because it's so easy for us to get caught up in our pet projects and interests. Many people from New Testament days until the present day have been and are tempted to worship success, money, possessions, celebrity status, but we mustn't, we mustn't do it. Worship in the new heaven and the new earth will be forever fresh. It will never grow old. It will never become boring because God is infinitely appealing and fascinating. We've probably all heard of churches today, services today, where people struggle to concentrate on listening to God's word for more than 30 minutes. My wife and I know of one family who left a church whose name is familiar to many to go to another where the so-called worship was more exhilarating, more in tune with modern life. 
Never mind that the doctrines which were taught there were unbiblical. What they were interested in was the hype, the worship, so-called. But in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul reminded his readers <coughs> that God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, <coughs> excuse me, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Making us alive in Christ, setting us free from guilt and bondage, was only the first stage of God's purpose for us. His ultimate goal was that we might become his trophies, put on display throughout all eternity, exhibiting the magnificence and all-surpassing riches of his grace manifested in Christ. Paul chose his words very carefully, for he also speaks of the ages during which God's purposes were kept hidden, whilst awaiting the full revelation of God's wisdom through the church, wisdom now made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. There will never come a time in heaven when we will know everything that can be known, experience everything that can be experienced, enjoy everything that can be enjoyed, because there will always be more. We enter heaven with a finite idea, a finite number of ideas about God and our present knowledge is extremely limited. Nothing in the scriptures suggests that we will ever be able to know everything that there is to know about him. For how can finite beings like ourselves know everything that there is to know about an infinite God? I'd like to suggest that as our knowledge of him grows, so our love will also grow. With each new insight will come more joy, more celebration, more worship, the more we love God, the more like him we shall become. We read, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. As we come to verse 4, we've come full circle, because as I started this statement with the, oh, started this study with the statement, we shall see his face, I pointed out, that this is a complete reversal of what we read in the Old Testament of not being able to see his face and live. I'd like to expand just a little bit on those thoughts before finishing. Although God had told Moses that no one might see his face and live, and thus placed him in the cleft of the rock, nevertheless when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone and he was obliged to place a veil over it when speaking to his fellow Israelites, only removing it when he entered the Lord's presence in the tent of meeting. Commenting on Moses' experience and the reason for him wearing a veil, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, told them that it was a symbol of the limitations of the law of God, it could only reveal the extent of people's sin, exposing them to judgment, which was why the glory of Moses' face faded away in time. The law has absolutely no moral power to enable people to obey it. People need to be renewed from the inside out. And Paul thus explains that when a person turns to Christ, the veil is taken away. When the Lord operates in someone's life through his spirit, not only are they freed from condemnation, the condemnation of the law, they experience an interior moral renewal. And that is precisely what the new covenant is all about. Because it has been introduced, God's purposes have been revealed. And Paul declares that, Already we with unveiled faces 
contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image, transformation which will become complete when we join him in glory. I mentioned that the Lord Jesus is the only person of the Godhead who became flesh and who therefore has a face. He became human eternally. His incarnation will never be reversed. There will never come a time when Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, ceases to be a man. We shall see his face. As I said before, this is more than just physical sight, because it goes much further than that. <coughs> we will know him. We will experience his love and grace <coughs> to an extent that is never possible in this life. The impossibility of seeing God, which has been true ever since the fall in Eden, will no longer apply to the children of God in the new heaven and the new earth. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, now we only see in a mirror indirectly or dimly or like in a riddle, then we shall see face to face. One day the Lord will unveil himself in all, in all his resplendence and glory and that experience will transcend anything that we have ever known or can ever know on this earth. We will be totally transported, transformed, and we will never grow weary of seeing him. Paul proclaimed something of this when again writing to the Corinthians he said, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate or reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is spirit. Much more could be said, but I'd just like to add one more thing as far as verse 4 is concerned, and that is the joy of forever knowing that we belong to the Lord. We read that not only will we see God's face, but his name will be written on our foreheads. Back in chapter 3, in the letter to the church in Philadelphia, God had promised to write God's name and the name of God's city, the New Jerusalem, on the ones who were victorious. We came across the same truth in chapter 7 and also in chapter 14, where the 144,000 of God's people were sealed on their foreheads. And here we find the same truth being declared on the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. This is God's way of saying that we belong to him. We are his. He will never let us go. Nothing will harm us. No one can snatch us out of his hand because he has put his seal on us. Just as the mark of the beast signifies loyalty to those who follow the beast, so God's mark on our foreheads reminds us that he has purchased us with a price and we belong to him. There will be no more light, night, they will not need light or a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever. We looked at the absence of night and the Lord being the source of all light in our last study, so I won't go back there now, except to compare our life today with that which is to come. Here, in this present world, everything is conditioned by the light of the sun or by artificial light which can be generated. Without light, there is no possibility of knowledge. But here, in the new creation, there will be no need of physical or artificial light because there will be no darkness. Finally, in the second part of verse 5, John tells us that God's children will reign forever and ever. He doesn't tell us over whom or over what we will reign, but we will reign. Back in chapter 5, the four living creatures and the 24 elders 
sang the new song declaring that those who have been purchased from every tribe, language, people and nation have become a kingdom of priests to serve and worship and they will reign on the earth. The text speaks of an everlasting reign. With and in Christ we will participate. We will reign as his servants, as priests exactly what it means and how it will happen we're not told but what I do know is that there will be no interruption no tentative of rebellion such as that which is envisaged by some towards the end of a literal millennium there will no be, be no possibility of a second fall for everything is consecrated and firmly established in the throne of God and of the Lamb this is our hope, those of us whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He is coming soon, and God willing, in our final study of this enthralling book, we will look at the epilogue. While waiting, let's remember the Lord's promise. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That was back at the beginning in Revelation chapter 2. We're approaching the end. We still have that same promise to the ones who are victorious. May the Lord enable us to be victorious and to praise him forever. Amen.